Uh, my name is Ann Peterson, and I'm a Friday docent, and I uh, graduated in 2010, so I'm a relatively new docent here. I see some of my colleagues out in the audience who've been here for quite a number of years. And one of the things that I discovered when I became a docent is how little I knew and how much I had to learn about the CMA collection as well as uh, perfect techniques of touring and things of that sort. And so what I have planned for you tonight is actually a more classic One Work, One Hour. One Work, One Hour is a program that the docents uh, organize and run that allows people to, first of all, develop a program where you intensively look at one work of art, but the idea is that you are modeling the experience of discussing not only the work of art and some of its elements, but the way in which you will tour it. And so what I've done tonight with the Schiller Collection is I'm going to give a short talk about it and then I'm going to divide you into groups. Yes, I am, and, you <laughs> and I'm going to give each group a different work of art from the Schiller Collection, and I'm going to ask you to work very quickly to create uh, a, a procedure for touring, some ideas for touring it, and then I'm going to ask each group to uh, report back to the larger group as a whole. So uh, this will be um, hopefully an opportunity for you to get some familiarity with the many, many works that are in the Schiller collection and also get kind of a head start on ideas about touring uh, some of these uh, works that are in the Schiller collection. I'm going to ask that each group give me the work that they develop and then I will try to put it together into sort of ideas for touring, which I'll have, uh, I'll send to Megan and ask her to put on the blog and in uh, the, the work and readings that you have. And uh, Megan has already provided for you a, a listing of the Schiller collection. It consists of 108 pages because the Schiller collection is 429 items at this point in time. It is a very, very large collection. But someday, you know, it snows in, in the winter here in Ohio, you can go on to the blog and you can kind of leaf through it and get some sense of what is in that collection and become familiar with it uh, yourself. So let's see if I can do this. All right. We acquired the Schiller Collection in 2005, and at that time, it consisted of 84 paintings, 374 prints, and one sculpture. And since I've never seen the sculpture, and maybe it has been out, uh, I put it there. It's about, apparently, 18 inches high, and it's by Nancy Grossman. Um, the CMA was interested in acquiring this particularly large collection because it is part of an effort to enhance our modern American collection. And uh, we take quite a great deal of pride in the materials that we have that are uh, 20th century modern. And that includes not only works by George Bellow, but a fantastic collection of his prints, which we have acquired, uh, selections from the Howell Collection, which Bob Bernard talked to you about, uh, the Ashcan School of Art, and the Photo League collection, which is another large collection that we acquired in 2001. Um, the collection itself um, was also acquired because it represented a great deal of diversity in the art and in the artist. It is a collection that focuses on social realism and social commentary. And it includes women artists, which aren't always represented in museums, uh, Jewish artists, several of whom had fled the Holocaust, uh, African-American artists, and artists who represent magic realism and social surrealism. In two weeks, uh, Melissa Wolf is going to come to you and speak about these issues. She's a fantastic speaker, and uh, she will speak more about those branches of art. Um, the 
uh, ma majority of these artworks are from the 1930s. And uh, approximately 60% of them are from that era. And another 78 art items are from the 1940s. So it's re they really the bulk of the collection is works from the 1930s and 40s. And the remaining items um, are from the 50s uh, through the 80s with one piece from 1991. Uh, the collectors of these items were, were and are Philip and Suzanne Schiller of Highland Park, Illinois. Uh, Philip Schiller is a real estate attorney uh, who grew up in Chicago on the west side and on his 40th birthday went to New York, went to the ACA gallery that was just mentioned in um, Carol's uh, talk and was alerted to the possibility of buying a work by Robert Guacme. This is the first work uh, that he bought in that collection. And eventually, he and his wife acquired 600 plus works of art, uh, of which we um, bought approximately two thirds in uh, 2005. One of the things that they wanted to do was sell the collection as a whole. There were museums who were interested in parts and pieces of it, but the uh, Schillers wanted it all in one piece. And so um, it was uh, negotiated out to be a gift purchase in much the same way that the Syrac uh, collection was. And the Syracs continue to collect, and they um, now have over 200 works of art, but they're uh, more interested in surrealist art. Um, in 1999, Philip Schiller published a book, and it's actually a fun read, and I'm going to give it to the collection. I, I, look, um, I think you'll enjoy it. He's a real deal maker, and he loves getting great deals on art, and so he sort of details his victories and auctions and uh, different kinds of negotiations. But he also outlines why it is he collected art. He said, if you are collecting art, don't do it for the money. It's one of the worst investments you can ever make because it's not going to pay off, except in some cases. So only buy what you love. And that is what he and his wife made it a point to do. They um, had to have things that they not only loved, but which produced a very strong emotional reaction in them. Uh, he wanted representational art because he was not someone who found the um, abstract expressionism that kind of dominated the post-World War II era to be um, to his taste. And he decided to narrow his field from 1930 to 1970, although, as I've already said, he acquired works from beyond that time. It focuses, as a result, on what he considers to be the major events of the 20th century, uh, specifically the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, World War II, the McCarthy era, and civil rights eras, and so on. Um, the Schillers live with this art, and that's one of the other things that he said in his book. They don't hide it away. They had it in their house every day. They added on to their house in Highland Park, and um, in a packet of reading materials that I sent, I wasn't able to get a good uh, look at, um, get a good photo of them with their uh, black and white etchings, lithographs, and so on, but they have those, or had them anyway, in one room. And uh, they also had, um, uh, as you see back here, that's uh, Philip uh, with the color uh, items that um, we're going to be looking at tonight in the group work. Um, the, um, they made it a point to lend out uh, their collection during the time that they owned it. And, but one of the very interesting things about Schiller himself is that he collected what some people call left-wing art, but he actually is a very conservative person 
uh, from an economic and political and social standpoint. And so he doesn't even agree with uh, many of the things that the artists who, who made these works suggested. He said, I can appreciate the artist's visions of these problems, even where I disagree with their solutions. I'm in tune with the art, even where I could never dine with the artist because we would give each other indigestion. <laughs> so he, he has a, a real sense uh, of uh, a kind of going against uh, making a statement in some ways with his art. The artists in the Schiller collection, there are 275 of them, five are unknown, uh, 40 are women, and the rest are men. And they, many of them, were employed during the New Deal in the federal art project. And you're going to find, as you discover, some of the other artists that are represented in our collection outside the Schiller collection, that many of them literally were able to stay alive because of the federal support that was provided to art. Uh, these are the people who painted murals, they did illustrations, they were art instructors. I just read a book about Louise Nevelson. She was an art instructor for the WPA. Uh, many of them bridged that period of time in the 1930s to uh, World War II and were supported in one type or another by uh, the federal government. And that also extended to uh, things having to do with literature and drama and other things. It was one of the most massive in, uh, in, um, investments in the art that the United States government has ever made. Uh, these artists were also, many of them, politically radical and even members of the Communist Party. And then during World War II, many of these same artists became involved in the war effort and they did propaganda films and posters and other types of things as part of that. Um, when the war ended, Interest in items of social realism uh, faded as the abstract expressionists, the color field theorists, and others began to take hold in the um, US. This is a, um, a picture owned by the uh, Columbus Museum of Art, under, and it's under the category on our <coughs> website of abstract expressionists. I don't know if this is the best example of it. But we have some, you know, the Frankenthaler color field theorists, and we have some others uh, in our collection that represent that wave of art. And we had a Rothko show uh, here a few years ago, and other people who were part of that. And this kind of representational art that Schiller uh, uh, collected uh, really fell out of, of favor. But um, he was very admiring of the artists who. Uh, he did collect and who were working during this period of time. And he felt that he was helping them um, sustain a certain type of art, that they were uh, continuing to address social issues in American society, which he thought was quite important. He said they, they fought the fight for their own private artistic freedom, and I admire them uh, more for it. In 1995, the uh, Schillers lent 62 items to an exhibit that was done uh, by the American Federation of Arts. And for that exhibit, the, um, the art historian Francis Pohl wrote a catalog. Uh, this catalog is still available on Amazon. I checked, and you can still, you, in some cases, get it for one penny plus shipping. If, if you're interested. And she does give a lot of very good background on the 62 items and the different artists that she, that are included in that. And here are the places where the uh, collection uh, traveled. The, I think what's interesting is that there's just a little gap here uh, from uh, West Palm Beach to uh, Minneapolis. The Schillers said they missed their collection and they wanted it to come home for a while. So it came home for six months before uh, they uh, let it go for its final thing. Yeah. Where can we get this? You can get it on Amazon and probably from other book selling uh, sites. It, and it, it is, uh, 
it is a nice overview. It's a short book, actually, so it's, it's not too hard. Okay, now, uh, this is um, just an overview of some of the items in the collection that I happen to like. I realize that I'm a person who likes pictures of people rather than pictures of, um, of, you know, landscapes or something of that sort. And so this is, just, this is just my own private favorite sorts of things. But when you go through the Schiller collection, you can decide what you like and what you think is uh, worthwhile. And uh, some of these have been up and some of them haven't been, so I'll let you take a minute to look at some of these. Portraits of men. Some of them are a little fuzzy. I had to lift them from that PDF document. So when you see them for real, they'll look much better. Groups of people of all different kinds. And another way to look at the Schiller collection is to look at it historically, according to the art that relates to the particular era. So, works from the 1930s look at depression, the depression and unemployment. That was also the decade of a major drought. You've heard of the Okies and having to travel to California because they couldn't grow anything on their land. Uh, the one on the lower uh, right there is up in gallery four right now. Uh, racial and ethnic discrimination, which is a very large segment of this collection. The Spanish Civil War and the rise of fascism. Urban poverty. Strikes and labor unrest. That was certainly part of that era in the 1930s. In the 1940s, the war years, some is, involves the rise of fascism and Nazism at home and abroad. That, uh, that uh, uh, Ben Shan in the upper left there is uh, Father Coughlin. He was a Detroit preacher. I'm, I'm kind of fudging. It was really done in 1940, but I thought I'd, or 19. Uh, 38 or something like that, so I'm, I'm slipping it into the 40s. But he, uh, there are several representations of Coughlin in this. Um, that's uh, a portrayal of fascism there by Sternberg, and some uh, obviously things having to do with the war effort, the aftermath of the war, and the emerging Cold War. That's a, um, a Rockwell Kent etching. It's a pretty Still very powerful, isn't it? A very powerful uh, etching. The, the sword or the gun is sort of just hanging there, ready to fall on that sleeping baby. Um, continued racial discrimination. In the 1950s, concerns with the Cold War and the threat of nuclear war, post-war growth and prosperity. Magic realism and social surrealism. This is where uh, the Schiller's interest began to shift into that area. And in the 1960s, the civil rights movement, the war on poverty, and commentary on modern life. Uh, here are some works from the, 50, uh, the 70s through the 90s. This is the 1991, um, the one 1990 uh, item uh, by Baskin. It's called, it's, it's something to the effect of, it's a pleasure to die for one's country. I, I don't know. I think that's in the surrealistic world. Um, there are some challenges to touring the Schiller collection. And uh, Megan said to me, oh, uh, many of the new docents, they, uh, they really hesitate to go into gallery four. It's just a little bit grim as far as they're concerned. But uh, there are some other challenges as well. First of all, the majority of items are black and white. 
and so they, uh, in some ways, do not grab the viewer's attention in the same way, and they are smaller than 11 by 14 inches. They're relatively small, which means that it's hard for a group to gather around them and to look at them. Many of the items require some historical background in order to understand what's going on. And finally, uh, the works themselves ask the visitor and the docent to confront uncomfortable realities and situations. And that is, of course, the point of social realist art. But it's not necessarily the case that people say, hey, I think I'm going down to the CMA today and just look at one social problem after another in the art world. I don't think people really do want to do that. Um, so the CMA has had some strategies for including these into uh, their uh, different galleries. Um, they have integrated them with respect to themes. We had a love and war theme at one time and other types of, of themes that allowed these to be featured. Now they are in a gallery all by themselves or they tend to be uh, kept in a gallery by themselves. In uh, two, 2012, uh, a conceptual artist, uh, Latifa Ekach, uh, put them together with lithographic stones. Uh, you know, 199 of the uh, elements of this collection are lithographs, and uh, the lithographic process is something that you can look up there's, um, and see how it's done. It's fairly complex, but um, they, um, these are very expensive and, uh, stones, and also it's, a, it's um, uh, quite a process. And additional works have also been included in um, the recent Shine On Nurses, and also in the Lucy Raven show, which just recently closed. So they're, they're around, but uh, not always evident. However, addressing the historical content of the Schiller collection as well as the uncomfortable nature of it um, remains a challenge for individual docents. And that is where I am going to now ask you to do some group work, unless, of course, you have some questions about the collection itself. No? Okay. We bought 459 works of art. And what we've done, uh, I, I spoke with um, Nanette about this, and she said that over the last several years, with the permission of the Schillers, some of them have been decommissioned in order to buy other works of art that we, that we do want, but it's still a substantial collection. They're still collecting. They're still collecting. It's a different collection. It's a different collection. It's more, um, more contemporary, I think, and more in the surrealistic uh, area. Any others? Questions? Yeah. Oh, yes, they did. They have two homes. They have a Highland Park home and one in Boca Raton, Florida, and so they, they kind of divide their collection up. <laughs> they didn't want to. They sold what they wanted to sell. Yeah. yeah. And there may still be some in that collection that they have currently that might be of interest to the, uh, to the CMA at some point in time. Other collections? Yeah, yeah. questions? Uh, no. Uh, the, he, uh, he grew up on the west side of Chicago and um, not Schiller the Poet, which is what the park is named after here. And, Columbus, so I don't know. He's very, very shy on the internet. It's very hard to find anything about the Schillers. They, they keep a low profile. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the reason uh, that apparently we came to their attention is that Nanette um, borrowed one of the works that I'm going to have you look at tonight, this one, uh, for a show. And uh, obviously got to know them, and they uh, then had the, um, you know, when they were beginning to think they would sell a portion of this collection, then uh, this museum came to their attention. And Annette at the time was the chief curator here. Any other questions? 
these are the ones we're going to go over. Some of these are hanging, and some of them are not. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to look at these, and that is where we're going to go. Okay, so I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of how many we have. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 5, 6, 7, 8. I think maybe groups of five, if you could, and this is a horrible room for group work, which I know, but um, if you could gather yourself into groups of five, and let me go back to the instructions. Um, I'm going to give each group a copy of one of these pieces of art and ask you to come up with some touring strategies.
Okay. All right, ready? I know you weren't given enough time, but it, it's sort of like being a docent. Sometimes you come into a gallery and you think you're going to be able to show one work of art, and guess what? It's either gone or someone else standing in front of it, or there's a group of people that you weren't expecting. So you sort of have to quickly come up with, with ideas. So let's start, first of all, with the um, Joe Jones American Justice. Here is the group doing that. Spokesperson. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Great, great observation. Uh Oh, you did? Okay. Wow. He worked for corporations, yeah, like Standard Oil and things like that. Odd, odd kind of inning. What a great job. Thank you. That is. This uh, item, by the way, is on tour currently. As a matter of fact, one of the docents came back from possibly Paris or somewhere where they were surprised to see it uh, on, on exhibit. It was part of a, a show that started at the Art Institute and is now traveling around. OK, Philip Evergood, Spring. This is hanging now. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, we look at work pieces. So uh, these people trapped under an overpass by a uh, factory. And in the background, you see a bunch of little electric up there. And they have a bunch of these things that you see most of all. Mm -hmm. Did you answer that question? Um, Why is it called spring? Well, you'll have to go up and see it and see oh. if you come up with.
Okay. Well, that's still very, very good. That's good for your quick, your quick thought about that. Oh, I went too fast. Okay. Jacob Lawrence. Okay. Well, very good. Thanks. This is currently hanging. And um, did you notice that uh, Carol Genshaft related Jacob Lawrence to Amina Robinson? He is a very well-known African-American artist who, like Amina, who documented Columbus, he, he said he wanted to document Harlem and the experience of African-Americans in general. So that was, that was just and the, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, very good. Okay, bombs away, Rockwell Kent, yeah.
Okay. Well, that's very, very good. Thank you so much. This uh, uh, is in response to the Bonica Buenca. And so uh, that, that has been, there are several pieces that reference that. Yeah. Oh, and how did it go? Well, yeah, I, yeah, I have prepared handouts that I've I've put here for you to uh, to take with you along the lines of what if I told you, and uh, what hit me in uh, reviewing the history of Guernica is that it was bombed as a buildup, really to World War II. The Germans and the Italians bombed this northern Spanish town in support of the effort of Franco to become the fascist ruler, I guess you would say, of Spain. And it just hit me, Syria, you know? It, re it, it really, suddenly, I just thought, wow, it's, it's amazing how. Uh-huh, yeah. It that did. Was yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was surprised. I had no idea, and I found that out when the Picasso show was here this this summer, that we had actually had it here in our museum. Unbelievable. Yeah. that kind of menacing, a menacing quality that's part of that. Well, this is, again, this is hanging, so this is something that you can take an opportunity uh, to take a look at in more detail. It's a fairly large painting, too. Okay, no one wanted to do that one. So here we are <laughs> with uh, Guafmi. Go ahead. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Very good. This uh, was the first work that Philip Schiller purchased, as I mentioned to you, and um, he was attracted to the yellow background. But I still find it puzzling, and it hasn't been up for quite a while. So I hope it comes back up. It's a very large, a large piece. Yeah. Okay, very good. Very interesting interpretation. Yeah, that's good. And that's the wonderful thing about art. So many possibilities. Okay, final one. Are there too many left back here who can talk about this? Yes, okay. Okay, well, that's, that's good, too. Well, I thank you all for participating, for staying. I know it's beyond the time. And uh, if you could give me your ideas and what it is uh, and the uh, picture that I handed out to you, I have handouts here in the front. And thank you so much. Sounds like we're going to have a lot of fun touring. Thanks.